I'd be nervous if I didn't realize I was in a room full of really awesome harm reduction people and real radical caregivers. Thank you. I'd first like to acknowledge the land in which we are gathered to here today as a traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation. Hi, everyone. My name is Bobby Jay. I'm one of the founding members of Overdose Prevention Ottawa and a chronic substance user. And because of some awesome harm reduction workers, I'm living in recovery today. <laughs> Thank you. I'm honored to be here today to accept the award on behalf of OPO. Last summer, Jessie, a young mother in my apartment building, died of a fentanyl overdose. It was one of many fatal overdoses in our community that year. And we were in grief. That grief turned into anger. Our anger motivated us into action. Our brothers and sisters were dying and we had to move into action fast. For one encouraging week or two, everything came together perfectly, inspired by Toronto. Uh, chronic substance users, harm reduction workers, nurses, professors, and caring community members, we came together to open Ottawa's first unsanctioned supervised injection site. Um, together we pitched tents in the park staffed by volunteers and funded by donations. Anyone could, anyone could come, use any drugs, and do so how they wished. What happened inside the tents, I like to call magic. Not only did we reverse overdoses, but we made important connections with drug users who benefited from our low barrier approach. What happened outside the tents, however, was another story. As we struggled with running an overdose prevention site with donations, volunteers, we had to devote precious resources and counter those working against us. The police, bylaw, our mayor, irate neighbors, and even those working in public health and harm reduction. Some of the, some. On one particular challenging day, we arrived to discover that over 400 pounds of manure had been dumped where we pitched our tents. Not only was that stench nauseating, but it posed a significant health risk to our guests, many of whom had compromised immune systems. Perhaps most troubling was that one of our most fierce opponents came from the very community we expected support from. I'm gonna stop right there because I had more of a rant to go on about, but I think in this, this climate we're in now, this political climate, I think I need to talk about more what brings us together than what divides us. <laughs> Thank you. In light of the challenges we faced, I want to thank the Association of Ontario Health Centers for recognizing us. Thank you. I would also like to add, this is personal, I'd like to have, I have mixed feelings because I feel that saving lives of the most vulnerable members of our community should be something that comes naturally to us as human beings. Not something radical or merits an award. My time at OPO taught me the power of resiliency and that amazing things can happen when people come together with a common goal. As we move forward, we need to remember those we've lost, the Crystals, the Raffies, the Mats, the Jessicas. Their spirits are with us and they push us toward the work we do. Please stand if you're able and let's take a moment of silence for the people that we've lost. Thank you. I'd like to close with a quote, a uh, harm reduction hero of mine, Rafi Balian. When you're doing what is the right thing to do, you have nothing to worry about. Thank you.
true form. I didn't write anything out. <laughs> uh, my name is Zoe Dodd, and I'm one of the co-organizers of the Moss Park Overdose Prevention Site. <laughs> this is Ikea and Olympia. We all work at the site. Many of us who work at the sites are people who actively use drugs, so don't ever believe that people who are using can't be some of the best healthcare providers in the world. <clears throat> uh, a year ago, I was here at this conference, and Minister Hoskins was here, and he, he delivered an address to all of us. And at that meeting, I slipped him a note and tried to speak with him because we tried many, many avenues to try to have a meeting with him to talk to him about the escalating overdose crisis. He never contacted us. Uh, it wasn't until a group of healthcare providers that we pushed uh, to, and organized got together and wrote a letter and a petition that we finally got that meeting with Hoskins. Uh, for us, we took a lot into our own hands. We did that because we were surrounded by death and watching the obliteration of the communities that many of us belong to, including our own co-workers. I think over the years, in the last two years, we lost about 12 harm reduction workers who were working in the community. The overdose crisis has taken thousands of people's lives, and we still have debates of whether we should have a needle exchange in our community health centers, or how do people who use drugs access, or if they should get pain management. We're having discussions about cutting them off and patients being abandoned, and we're just creating a climate for an escalating crisis to continue, and we really need to be reflective as we move forward on what our contributions are going to be. Many of us felt abandoned to respond on our own, but we took it into our own hands and we demonstrated that community action, collective power, and our knowledge could save lives. We, st <laughs> On August 12th, after a meeting with the mayor of Toronto and we realized they weren't gonna do much, we went, got drunk, and went into the park. <laughs> The day later, it's all you take is some drinks to give you some gumption, uh, and we decided we were gonna pitch some tents and we went for it. And I think all of us thought we wouldn't get through that day, but somehow we did, and we didn't know we'd get through a weekend, and we didn't know we'd make it through a week. 10 months later, we celebrated our 10th month anniversary yesterday. <laughs> We've witnessed thousands of injections, inhalations, made community connections, reversed over 220 overdoses. We helped to change Canadian drug policy, the Ontario policies around OPS, but I'll tell you right now that funding is not enough and six months is something I feel very disappointed in the Liberal government for not giving us at least one year. So here we are in a climate where we may have to fight and that struggle will continue and at the cost of that are people's lives. And so I implore everybody in this room, everyone who works in healthcare, everyone, who, you all have a stake. And so I implore you to please get involved. Help us continue with the struggle. Help us so that we don't you know, lose more people because we are at the height and it's going to keep going. And for many of us, we don't see an end in sight and we don't want to lose more of us. So I think I'll let Olivia <laughs> Nikia wants to say something, but thank you so much, AOHC. I was here last year for an award for our advocacy while we waited for exemptions, and we were like the first, actually, injection site in Ontario, because we didn't really wait for that exemption. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Akia. Um, I am a little nervous. Um, so now we're here. Um, now we're realizing that we can do something. Um, in Ottawa, we're doing something, or they, they, we, we're, folks were still trying to do something, folks are stopping them. Here we're trying, folks are stopping us. Wh wherever we go, we try to keep fighting and folks are stopping us, and this is where we need to get together. Um, this is when we need to mobilize. This is when we need to say no more people on the street, no more anti-poverty deterrence, no more. And these are all different parts of harm reduction. These are all different parts of what keeps Moss Park going, what keeps so, so like SISs and SESs at the heart of that, that's what keeps it going, um, is that, that drive, that ambition, and that understand, that ambition to, 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 to really finally get a proper value and give a proper value and allow folks to give other people proper values of, of their life, of our lives. Our lives are super duper important. Our lives 
are also what keep saving other people's lives. At, at the OPS, we are, we are like, we're so successful because we are peer oriented, because we have that lived experience, because we understand what it's like to go from vein to brain, understanding and thinking and feeling. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm making any sense. <laughs> but, but we need you. We need all of us. This is a crisis. This is an emergency. This is a mass slaughter. Um, but we can stop it. Um, and this is just an example. This acknowledgement is a landmark saying that there, we're making, that people are making progress and we are awarding people for that. We're giving them accolades for that and we can all continue to do that. It, it, it just, we need to do it together. Yeah. I just want to say to the cop, I, I hope next year I hear you say the words decriminalization and I hope that comes from everyone in this room because the only way we're going to get out of it is if we end the drug war and we end, you know, and that starts with decriminalization. That is what's fueling this crisis. I mean, we said so many things in 2008. We said, or we're actually was, yeah, Oxycontin. We said, if you take Oxycontins off the market, this is where exactly where we're going to be. I don't know how many people, how many tables we said it to. We kept saying it over and over and over, and here we are, and we cannot continue as business as usual. So that happens everywhere, and I really implore everyone to help us in this struggle. And thank you, Ottawa. It's nice to meet you because we hadn't met in person, but you know, we were so inspired that they took it up as well because we needed each other. So thanks a lot. <laughs> I just quickly want to say, like, we literally just, we're very passionate people, and we just believe, you know, if no one else is going to do it, so we got to do it. And we literally, on the 11th of, of August at the um, Thraw meeting, we were like, oh my gosh, everyone's dying. Four people died in Moss Park in like, I don't know, a day or two. So we just, all of us got together. Some people got high because they, you know, are stronger and work better. And we opened it up. And it's very frustrating that doctors aren't writing prescriptions for people who are in pain, whether it's physical or mental. People know what they need in their body. And like, can you just pull out your prescriptions, get together and start writing them? Because you know, we went in the park and sacrificed jail. I'm an injection drug user and I sacrificed everything. Like I can go to jail. Um, we lost our best friend in Brooklyn and that's like pretty much why the safe injection sites was passed and like I would rather her be here but you know can you guys all the doctors in this room please get together and just like you know go over that paper that's like you know the rights and your duty to do whatever in the medical profession and just write down like if we don't give these people the, like the medication they need aka heroin and hydromorphine more people are going to die and we're actually doing a disservice people are not fulfilling their duty of care, write it down that you guys are smart people and send it in. And if they say no, just start writing prescriptions. Like I'm pretty sure the pharmaceutical companies will get on board because they're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> so just do it. Good afternoon, and uh, <clears throat> first off, a deep thank you to the AOHC Board of Directors for this award, and my heartiest congratulations to the other award winners, both organizations being stellar leaders with bold and breathtaking achievements. I've never spoken on behalf of people who use drugs or any patients, so I'm going to lighten this up a little bit and let them speak for themselves as only they can. In June 2012, I attended an AIDS conference in London, England, the subject being treatment as prevention, an edgy topic at the time. I was quite jet lagged. I went to the washroom just before the plenary session, and beside me at the urinal was a plenary keynote speaker, an impeccably dressed gentleman, an internationally known scientist a few years older than me. Please do not worry, this story is not in bad taste. And it is relevant to these awards and what you've just heard today. Now, due to my younger age, I finished first and, <laughs> pro and proceeded to the entrance exit door of the washroom. I was in a foggy state from jet lag and distracted as I was contemplating the conference proceedings. A short distance from me at the washroom exit, another man stood. 
I said, excuse me, and moved to the right. And, and as I did so, he moved straight in front of me. So, well, I moved to the left. And he moved again directly in front of me. And I thought, this is really weird. This guy is blocking my exit. As I moved again, this time to the center, the keynote speaker, having finished his business, strode by me, casting a querulous expression my way. And he then proceeded at a quick pace to the proper exit a few meters down. Me, I had been standing in front of a floor-to-ceiling mirror, <laughs> trying desperately to escape my own reflection. The, uh, the keynote speaker showed me the right way out. Now, I detest platitudes, but sometimes they are expressions of eternal truth. And none of what I've done professionally or politically in the area of drug use could have been done alone. And as with my washroom colleague, patients in my medical practice have directed, advised, and led me as we together engaged in the substance use issues of the day. I recall and paid tribute to the three heroin addicts, as they then called themselves, who in early 1992 held a widely covered press conference at Queen's Park, decrying the lack of access to methadone, the response of the allegedly social democratic government of the day, the NDP, to say that methadone was controversial and refusing to do anything about it. A few weeks later, another two patients who were on methadone in my practice engaged in a successful, highly visible poster campaign. All I did was contribute a, a Xerox machine and a staple gun. One of the people in the couple was an artist and drafted a poster that said, heroin addiction, methadone is the best treatment. If you need help and want methadone, please phone Michael Dechter, Deputy Minister of Health at the Province of Ontario. And at the bottom there's a tear off of Mr. Dechter's private phone number, which has been leaked to us <laughs> from a close friend inside the ministry. Suffice to say, Mr. Dechter phoned that cold Saturday morning demanding a meeting the next week. And at the meeting with my patients, he promised to increase methadone by 100 spots and funded the Parkdale Community Health Centers to do so. This anonymous couple, both who have since died of AIDS, cracked open methadone in Ontario 26 years ago. And now the number of people on methadone is over 500 times that original 100 funded by the province. And finally, the patient who nine years ago put her name on a human rights complaint against the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, my regulatory body, for keeping the names and personal information of methadone patients on a patient registry. The registry was abandoned two years ago. In the late 19th century, Dr. William Osler, a British and Canadian patriarch of medicine and medical education, famously said, just listen to your patient he is telling you the diagnosis. It has been the many drug-using patients who over decades have taught me more than I could ever learn in a lecture hall. They are the greatest professors of all. Thank you for so kindly listening to me.